I have a new clothing line coming up. You'd be perfect for a model. And I covered it up for so long. Everything, shopping, working, making money, drinking. At the end of the day, it was always there. I need to be brave and I need to be courageous. And I think um, the indigenous community needs to know it was me. That's the start of healing. That's how it starts. That's how it begins is by saying something and speaking about it. Nadine Wustus is speaking out about her past for the first time with her name attached. Well, I got scooped because my mom was a chronic alcoholic and somebody had phone CFS. So she went on a binge and then they came and picked up me and my brother. And then we remained in foster care together in the first foster home um, for, I don't know, it was 18 months, so what, eight and a half years. And she lived in many foster homes over the years. At 11, she was sent to the Seven Oaks Youth Center after she says she was abused in her previous foster homes. When I first entered institutions, I was 11 years old. And this is from the, the abuse I suffered in the first, first foster home. So then I was already troubled. I was mute. So I, I wasn't talking. I was just like, I, I wouldn't talk because of the abuse. I couldn't talk. I was so internalized. Um, and I wouldn't speak about it. Because I was like, oh, nobody's going to believe me. This is what... I guess this is what how, how my life was supposed to be. I would just run to the streets. I met a lot of kids on the street, like a lot of indigenous kids who were in care, and then we just, yeah, we were just all out there. <laughs> Two years later, she ended up at Marymount, a Winnipeg school for troubled girls. And I remember there's all different kinds of girls. A lot of those girls I ended up being in jail with, out on the street with, um, carried through addiction with. Some aren't even here anymore. In the U.S. class action brought against Peter Nygaard last year, Nadine is known as Jane Doe, number 44. Nygaard asked Jane Doe, number 44, her age, and she told him that she was 14. Jane Doe, number 44, frequented an area in Winnipeg where there were a lot of indigent young people. Here we are in 2021 on the lonely stretch of street in Winnipeg's North End. So turn right. So up all along to that church there, all the way down here, this is where a lot of indigenous girls, myself included, would stand. So we would sit right there, a lot of us, yeah. It's a horrible place to remember. And a lot of my peers, like, we were out here. A lot of us girls that were in care and were underage who were out here. And yeah, and the men were richer. The men were richer the younger I was. So from age 11 to 13, they were really rich. Yeah, I remember the nice cars, the suits. If you were underage, you would be on this side of the tracks uh, between Flora and Sutherland up until here. And then on the other side of the tracks, that's where the, the adult women would grow, go. And a lot of times, um, yeah, younger girls would try to cross the tracks and they would get their ass kicked or <laughs> tell them, go back to kitty track. <laughs> 
I was criminalized. I don't know. I don't even how, know how many times I was charged. I think I remember the first time, I think I was 14 and I had to go to court. And one of the girls in my group home, um, she came from the same background. And so she dressed me up and did my hair. And I was like, oh, I've never been dressed up like that before and for court. And I was like, oh, they'll probably just get a slap on the hand. But they embarrassed me. <laughs> they put me in the box and um, read out my charges. And I was so mortified. There's lots of bad memories. Nadine's comments in her interview with APTN echo the allegations in the U.S. class action. Nygaard coerced Jane Doe No. 44 to perform oral sex on him in his car while parked behind the Nygaard Company warehouse. Nygaard would become very aggressive during Jane Doe No. 44's sexual encounters with him. According to the allegations, he also made her promises. Nygaard would pay Jane Doe No. 44 after each occasion in U.S. currency and would continue to promise her that he could take her to California. These allegations have not been proven in court. We sent these allegations to Nygaard's lawyers, but we haven't heard back. At that time, I was running away to my mom's and my stepdad's, and uh, I would go, I went there, and I was like, oh, mom, I have a modeling opportunity. Nadine's mom has passed away, but those photos survived. And at that time, she's like, wow, okay. And she started taking pictures. I ended up phoning there, and they said, I didn't know what to say because I was so young. I'm like, I didn't have anybody speaking for me, so I just didn't follow through with it, which I'm thankful for. Now, almost 30 years later, she is back on the street where she worked as a survival sex worker for decades. So when you were back here now as an adult woman with all the healing that you've done, what do you think? I just think um, to use my voice to use what I've been through and what I know about now, about the system, about racism, genocidal politics, child trafficking, child pornography, and try to change the system again. <laughs> A lot of men at that time in Winnipeg knew about that place and knew where to get young indigenous girls. Most of those girls that were out there were young indigenous girls. Uh, a lot of girls at that time didn't have a lot of choice. It was either go to the Seven Oaks and get abused or go to the group home and be displaced and, you know, not taken care of or whatever. Troubled girls thinking that they were going to be safe and it wasn't like that. I was far from it. The U.S. indictment brought against him alleges that Nygaard targeted women and girls from backgrounds similar to that of Nadine's. Peter Nygaard, the defendant and others known and unknown, frequently targeted women and minor-aged girls who come from disadvantaged economic backgrounds and or had a history of abuse. Nadine says she believes there are others in Winnipeg with stories like hers. How likely is it for Indigenous women to come to the police? It's highly unlikely. Like, it took me a lot of balls and a lot of courage to do that, coming from the street. <laughs> so, like, just, I did it because it needed to be done. And I knew I wasn't the only one. But with Nygaard's lawyer, Jay Prober, under investigation for his comments about his client's accusers, how likely are they to come forward? We'll have that when we come back.
the flashbacks of what really happened started coming and hitting me. And like I said, like I was in hospital, like from seizures, because my body was not, uh, my whole central nervous system was off. And the flashbacks would literally shake my core to the point where when I'd had flashbacks, I would almost end up in seizures. Nadine says the cost of coming forward with her allegations is very high. I covered it up for so long. Everything, shopping, working, making money, drinking, running away. I was like, it's just covering up. And it, in the end, at the end of the day, it was always there. And I'm just taking the layers off and getting to the core. When you look at uh, residential schools and its intent, uh, it was there to disconnect us from everything that we knew. Um, everything that, uh, such as our family, such as our culture, the land. Um, so once that disconnection uh, occurred, it continued to reverberate throughout each generation. And so we're seeing those effects today. Crystal Brown is a Justice Development Coordinator with the Southern Chiefs Organization in Manitoba. She says the alleged victims of Nygaard who are Indigenous are especially vulnerable. So um, that disconnect from your family, um, you know, that creates uh, trauma such as violence, um, various abuses, um, mental health um, issues. And the justice system is just not set up to support them. Um, I hope that they're able to get the legal counsel and support, um, you know, to pursue this. It takes a lot for, for someone to speak up and, you know, specifically for Indigenous women whose voices have been, you know, continually silenced throughout history. Bear Clan founder James Favell who sat in to support another alleged Nygaard victim, says Nadine's story is not uncommon in Winnipeg's North End. What I've witnessed in my lifetime, I live in the North End, and so when we see uh, the victimization that goes on in our community, the exploitation that goes on in our community, it is almost always from somebody outside of our community that comes in and, you know, and does these things. And he points out Indigenous women are much less likely to report to police. There was that mistrust and again we can't expect somebody to come in and save us. It has to be us protecting ourselves and protecting our own. We have the capacity and so we just needed to, to work on it and develop it properly. Therapist Shannon Maroney, who is also treating Nadine, agreed. And so when we look broadly then at Indigenous experiences, Indigenous lived reality, those vulnerabilities are vast. They're appalling and they're, they're shameful. I feel ashamed as a, as a white Canadian as we live in this time of truth and reconciliation to have you know, realized or the extent to which, uh, I think I could say this broadly, I think my own, my own education began many, many years ago, um, but that the extent of the vulnerability among Indigenous people in Canada is, is 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 huge and so there is they're much more likely to be trafficked assaulted and then on top of that not feel that they would ever be able to report to police when there is systemic racism uh, there are many barriers that would you know tell them don't even bother you know coming forward no one will believe you you're a, a lower class of a person in this country and that rings true for Nadine herself. Because I was vulnerable. I was in a, in a very vulnerable place. I was, I was a little girl. And I was indigenous at that time. I couldn't say anything. They wouldn't believe me. They just would look at me as another statistic. Like they do most indigenous girls, not knowing the background of their stories. And for you to go to the police as a young girl, what would have happened? They probably would have just laughed at me, charged me for whatever. 
It was many years before she reported to the Winnipeg police in 2020. And I went and made a statement and I went to try to go press charges. And yeah, we're still waiting. While the U.S. class action is ongoing, charges have not been filed against Nygaard in Canada. University of Manitoba assistant law professor Gerard Kennedy says the process for extradition could go on for years. It definitely could for a couple of reasons. First, it will likely be several months at least before there is a judicial hearing as to whether or not there's sufficient evidence to justify Mr. Nygaard's extradition. And there are a number of steps to consider. I, I will just say several. Yeah. Because there's so many unknown facts. There are. I mean, the, also the fact of the matter is there are some arguments Mr. Nygaard could make, that, or that, that was a little, that one could theoretically make to resist extradition that Mr. Nygaard will have a very hard time making. Like he would have a difficult time saying the acts that the U.S. wants him to be charged for are not crimes in Canada. They're very similar, yes. He explains that nothing in the extradition process stops Canadian police from charging Nygaard here. It's a completely separate process. If, he, if the police and the Crown wanted to charge him for crimes that took place in Canada, they would be permitted to do so. There is then an interesting question of prosecutorial discretion, as well as the, um, from an international relations perspective, whether Canada wishes to jump ahead of the United States. Um, but there's nothing precludes his simultaneously being charged in Canada. Nadine says it's highly unlikely more Indigenous women like her will come forward. I urge you to talk to the police, talk to somebody in sex crimes and come forward because you're not alone. Per their policy, Winnipeg police would not confirm nor deny her story. Nadine says she's in a bit of a limbo while she waits for police to investigate Nygaard in Canada. Yeah, not only did that time on the street defile me, dehumanized me, tarnished me as a person, tarnished my character, my reputation, everything, basically, and now I just have to rebuild. There is stigma attached to Nygaard's alleged victims even from Nygaard's own lawyer, Jay Prober. And as I predicted before, more women are jumping on what they perceive to be the money train, the gravy train. They see this as a cash cow. I believe that explains the rather ludicrous number of additional plaintiffs. The allegations are completely false. They are part of a vicious and malicious conspiracy. We say it amounts to a criminal conspiracy. Shannon Maroney filed this Manitoba Law Society complaint in December 2020, alleging that Prober's comments amounted to professional misconduct. The vigorous defense of a client, including public statements, is something that my clients and I respect, but we draw the line at intimidation defamation, insult, and criminal allegations. My clients and I strongly feel that Mr. Prober fell below the standards of the Law Society of Manitoba Code of Professional Conduct Rules. Prober apologized to one of the alleged victims in 2021. I am truly sorry that she felt the comments I made were related to her when they were not. And for that, I sincerely and publicly apologize. We asked Prober for comment, but we didn't hear back. And the Manitoba Law Society said they wouldn't comment on specific cases. Peter Nygaard is not speaking to the media. His lawyers did not respond to our request for comment. He was denied bail in spring 2021. He is currently detained in Headingley Prison, west of Winnipeg. His extradition hearing is scheduled for November 2021.
Serena Hicks has stood alone for most of her life. And when you're not connected with your community, as an Indigenous woman, as an Inuit woman, when you're not connected with your community, you're standing by yourself. I still haven't heard from the Crown. Canada, I don't have the faith in, but the FBI, for some reason, I have faith in. I, and I can't tell you why or what that is. My justice is just going to be me getting better. Nadine says she is not defined by her past. I was like always just a little girl. I never got a chance to be a little girl. Or a teen. When did you leave that life? I left that life when I got pregnant with my son, my 11 year old. I just quit, I just like, I had enough. I'm like, this is getting me nowhere. I want to be a mom. I want to quit the lifestyle. And I did, I quit doing the drugs, I quit the lifestyle. And um, I got pregnant and I, I, that little boy changed my life. <laughs> And they call him a gift from God. That's what his name means. So I need to be brave. And I need to be courageous. And I think um, the indigenous community needs to know it was me. I told my family it was me. I told them to be care. I said that I'll be doing interviews. Um, there is different networks from everywhere that just been hounding me when the story broke and I was like how did they get my number how do they know who I am this is freaking me out who are all these people I don't know any of them and then um, I think it's an important story because this is like historical trauma at its finest misogynistic trauma at its finest power mongering at its finest. I just wish I could have said something sooner. I wish I wish I had my voice when I lost my voice. <laughs>